Lindsay, thanks for being with us. Lots of info to unpack here. What's it like trying to keep up? Well, Dennis, I mean, there are two real considerations to have here. On a personal level, I mean, eight months have passed since Joy Teshaquan died, but this is still a very raw memory for the people that it touches directly. So listening to them revisit the night she died, revisit how she, uh, you know, was really a sunny presence in, in their lives prior to that night is difficult. But on the other hand, as a journalist, there's a lot of technical considerations to have here. And if we compare it to other commissions we've seen in Quebec, it's not as accessible as we would have hoped. Um, you know, the the testimony is not not the recordings of the testimony are not uh, accessible after the fact. There are no transcripts available. There is no simultaneous translation from French to English. And not only that, a lot of the information that's being presented is protected by not one but two separate publication bans. So it's easy to understand that there is an intense public interest in this case, and people want analysis and up to the moment, you know, updates about what's being said and by whom. But it's proving to be a bit of a challenge bringing the information forward in a concise way, in a timely way, and more, most importantly in this case, in a correct way. Absolutely. Well, that said, we're hearing that there was some big drama in the courtroom today. Yeah, so the first week of testimony, we heard from the family, you know, about what happened, how Joyce was brought to hospital, what, what were they informed of, you know, after the fact. And this week, we moved to the medical perspective, so hearing from the healthcare workers at Joliet Hospital. And today, in particular, we heard from the nurse who is seen in the video that Joyce live streamed to Facebook, the one who picked up the phone and who stopped the recording and deleted it out of a panic. So she testified today, very emotional. Uh, you know, really wanted to get across the fact that she is contrite about what happened. She blames the environment at the hospital, obviously the stress of the pandemic, uh, and says that she essentially blacked out. She didn't realize what she was saying in the moment until she saw the video after the fact. So that's one segment of drama from this morning. And after that testimony, uh, a lawyer actually asked for a private audience with the coroner. And about five to ten minutes later, the coroner announced to the open courtroom that the health care workers who have testified so far in open court, their names protected by a publication ban, are still receiving death threats, and death threats serious enough that the provincial police are actually now investigating them. So if you can imagine, this is just a snapshot of one day in this commission that's been going on for almost seven and still is going to go on for another two weeks. So a lot of, a lot of curveballs to account for. Absolutely. Uh, Lindsay, have we learned anything new about Joyce in this process? So, Dennis, it's really interesting. What we're dealing with right now are actually dueling portraits of Joyce. So in the first week, we heard about Joyce described as the mother of a community, you know, the mother of seven children, the love of Carol Dubé's life, you know, really the light of her, of her community and, and a representation of the Atikamek Nation as a whole. And then here... This week, you know, we're learning more about Joyce as a hospital patient. So Joyce, who had quite a few what we call comorbidities, so uh, extensive heart problems, type 2 diabetes. Um, and most importantly, it was discussed this week that she may have had a narcotics dependency that would have kicked off with a doctor's prescription at some point in the recent past. So the healthcare workers who testify claim that Joyce was agitated from the start when she arrived at the hospital hospital that she was demanding morphine and that's actually a direct contrast to what we heard at the beginning the rumors that she was allergic to morphine and may have been injected purposely so a lot of information coming out hard to make heads or tails of it here it really is a bit of a, a perfect storm situation a lot of moving pieces to consider what about the hospital itself uh, what more do we know there so pretty much everybody who's testified so far, they were asked directly about whether they received cultural sensitivity training. And across the board, they said no. Uh, most of the healthcare workers there only received a three-hour online workshop to sensitize them to indigenous realities. We don't know anything about who was leading those workshops or what was covered or if there was any follow-through after the fact. So hopefully the situation is going to change uh, shortly after Joyce died. Uh, Minister of Indigenous Affairs actually announced 
a big financial investment in this area, mandating cultural sensitivity training for healthcare workers at Joliet or in communities serving the Atika Mek Nation. Again, we don't know much about who is going to be leading those or what the follow through is going to be, but the impression we get is that these nurses are dealing with a high volume of patients, they're understaffed, they're stressed, and in the words of the nurse who testified today, at times they're forced to work like slaves, and they believe this contributed to the care that Joyce received. Part of the inquiry's focus is getting answers, but what kinds of questions are coming up as it plays out? So this is something that I actually have just learned. This is my first coroner's inquest. And my impression at first was that the coroner is there sitting in essentially the director's seat and watching the scene play out between the witnesses and the lawyers who are charged with questioning them. I did not know that she can cut in and essentially ask questions herself and try to fill in informational gaps as she identifies them. So this is called an enquête, so translated to investigation. So it's an investigation in an investigation. This has happened twice in the last week. It happened on Monday after hearing from both the emergency room doctor and the gastroenterologist who cared for Joyce and came out that there's essentially a two hour uh, chunk of time where it's unclear which doctor or medical service was responsible for her care. So Gehan Kamel, the coroner, put out an appeal to Joliet Hospital. She wants all of the records that state very clearly the chain of care in Joyce's case. And then again today, she came out and reacted to this continuous narrative about Joyce seeking morphine. She wants a year's worth of Joyce's hospital charts, and she wants hard evidence and hard notes that indicate that Joyce presented at hospital to seek medication. And she also made the distinction that it's, it's very different when a patient goes to hospital seeking care for pain and is given a prescription for medication, and when a patient shows up in withdrawal or in alleged withdrawal demanding medication. So as things kind of unfold, we're seeing contradictions, but for the most part, the coroner seems to be on the ball, making sure that everything is laid out in as clear of a fashion as possible. Lindsay, lots going on here. We'll have to leave it there, but uh, appreciate your coverage of this uh, and filling us in on it today. Thanks for having me, Dennis.